start off with, we're going to um, have Margaret Allen, who is the State Librarian of Western Australia and um, a member of our board and also the Chair of the Australian Library's Copyright Committee. Um, do you want more no, of her bio? No. Yeah, I didn't think she did. Um, um, and uh, Margaret uh, is going to run you through um, what has been going on in the last few years with Standards Australia, because we know a lot of people know a little bit about this and know that there is a bit of an issue about access and licensing, um, but they don't know um, the full details. So Margaret's been right in the fray from the start, so she can tell us all. Okay. Thanks, Jess. And um, yes, I'm not sure that there's been a big opportunity out of this yet. I haven't quite seen it. So anyway, um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the National Library sits. And we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So developments with Australian standards. Well, Jess asked me to talk about this. She said, you've got 20 minutes. I said to her, well, that'll take about five seconds because actually there's been no recent developments, but um, there actually has been some movement in the last couple of days, which I'll touch on. But instead, I thought a bit of a potted history around this, uh, what I think is a somewhat sorry saga. And you'll see where a right and a necessity comes in in due course. Okay, let's, oops, hang on, I'm just, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, there we go, I'll go old school. So, it's a somewhat familiar story. So, we have a monopoly supplier who garners significant profit from the work of others a product licence offering which is really at odds with the core role of libraries in providing access to information. We have licence agreements that override exceptions in the Copyright Act, which further erode the ability of libraries to meet their core role. We have government reports on the table that make some somewhat sensible suggestions, but they lay uh, dormant. And we have ongoing advocacy by the sector, which uh, is ongoing, um, but somewhat slow or makes very little progress. So I think it's a story that many of us, particularly who work in the library sector, would be very familiar with. But critically here, we're talking about access to the laws of Australia. So it's, a, I think, a somewhat different case. So I'll cover a bit of a potted history. It will be mainly from the perspective of National and State Libraries Australia, but I acknowledge that there has been advocacy and ongoing work by colleagues in the university sector and uh, the COAG um, education group. So there's about 2,000 Australian standards that are referenced into Australian laws, regulations and bylaws, and that gives them a quasi-legal status. So this is at federal, state and local government level. Actually, the real number involved can't even be agreed by all the parties, but I think regardless, when you're talking about 2,000 individual standards, you'd agree that it's a very large corpus of material. And standards are used in all sorts of areas referenced in Australian law. So think um, public interest areas like public health, environmental uh, and other safety standards, fire safety standards. There's all sorts of other things, public interest topics, you know, COTS, uh, motorbike helmets. There's a whole range of Australian standards that are referenced in laws and therefore become law. Now, as with other Australian laws, these standards ought to be readily and easily available free of charge, but they're not. And a fundamental democratic principle is that citizens should have the right to access the laws that affect them. And transparency and regulatory transparency really also relies on easy access to the law. Even um, parliamentarians can't um, readily get access to it. There are exceptions for parliamentary librarians, but not for parliamentarians. Um, unlike the UK, and I think 
well, New Zealand, there's actually specific exceptions that enable parliamentarians to get access to the content they need. And this is really important because it's about scrutinising the laws of the land as they move through Parliament. Now, Standards Australia is a peak non-government, non-profit organisation responsible for the development of standards. And they coordinate and publish the work um, of a range of subject matter experts to develop these standards. Now, these subject matter experts come from right across business, government and academia. And their time is almost always funded by their employer, as is the expenses and the travel expenses and the other expenses to attend the meeting. So the intellectual effort is pretty well all volunteer or funded, at least funded by other people. And this was specifically recognised in an in inquiry that I'm going to talk about shortly. But you can see that the inquiry summarised it by saying whilst the cost of creating and publishing the standard and overseeing the process um, is borne by Standards Australia, it's entirely dependent on the voluntary effort of others. So volunteers are creating the standards which are then become law but community can't get to that part of the law. Now, Standards Australia have a formal MOU with the Australian government, and that MOU, which includes funding, um, includes recognition that they represent Australia at the at international forum uh, around standards. So they're actually recognised and given licence, if you like, by the government to act on our behalf in terms of standards. And that adds to their uh, status as being a peak body. Now, there is a sort of a long history to this, but um, in 2003, Standards Australia spun off what was then their publishing arm to and became SAI Global. SAI Global was subsequently acquired by a private equity firm. And I think we can work out what's happened from there. But this was because of a perception of a conflict of interest between their role in developing standards, publishing, marketing and selling them, and also being the assessor. And if you remember back to the quality movement, what was it, uh, whichever it was, 9001, and everyone was accredited, they were doing all of those functions. So it was a perceived conflict of interest, which is why the publication and marketing of the standards was spun off. So, libraries and access to Australian standards. They are relatively high cost when we compare them with our other digital resources. They are offered on very restrictive access terms. Usually, uh, in the past, has been a single terminal within the building, printing limited to one page, no interlibrary loan. We're talking about the digital here. Um, and we were subject to annual subscription fees of CPI plus 2%, and that's because of the agreement between Standards Australia and SAI Global, so um, well above CPI in terms of the costs that we were incurring. And in 2016, NASLA walked away from um, the agreement because it was just too difficult. So, and we, this was after a very long standing, um, difficult relationship and us trying to renegotiate it. So that's a bit of a sorry tale too. So in um, 2015, Western Australian Parliament got a bit concerned about this, and I'm sorry for all of the text in here, um, but the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation actually became concerned about its inability to scrutinise legislation because they couldn't get access to the standards that they needed to undertake that role. And that is the role of that committee, is to scrutinise legislation, regulation and, and, and other legislative matters. So they couldn't get copies easily in the parliament without paying for them. Their staff couldn't get to them without paying high costs. So in a sense, it was getting in the way of the democratic process. So there was uh, an inquiry. And there's a very good and detailed report which has covered everything from the financial relationship between Standards Australia and SAI Global, um, 
lots of submissions from the library sector, from NASLA, from ALIA, from CALL, from Public Libraries WA, from the State Library of Western Australia, and as well unions and businesses were making the case around how difficult it was to access standards. So something that started in a way as an issue around scrutiny in Parliament actually turned into, I think, much more of a public interest um, question. Interestingly, um, the Commonwealth, in their response to questions from the committee, assumed, and in fact the letter from the then Minister, actually said that, well, you can get access, what's the problem? I'm paraphrasing, yes. Um, but you, you can get access to standards in Australian libraries. Didn't even know that, in fact, that was not possible. So the public policy um, position on ensuring that the laws of Australia were freely available relied on public libraries. So the committee decided that there was clearly a problem. Um, and you can see just the first paragraph. Um, this was effectively um, saying that, um, effectively in the state of Western Australia, this was a Western Australian inquiry, but um, the only place that you could see a lot of the law was in an office in metropolitan Perth between 9 and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday, which was a very unsatisfactory position in a democratic um, society. So they, they recognised that there was a problem. Now, the committee didn't ignore the question that funds are needed to produce standards, that it, you have to have income, it has to find a way to be uh, self-sustaining. But interestingly, they found that the money spent from Western Australia alone, so this is not across the nation, um, which was estimated at some $5.5 million um, in revenue from Western Australia to Standards Australia, of which a million dollars came from the public purse. Um, but that $5.5 million was actually almost the same as that derived by Standards Australia from their publishing agreement with SAI Global. So in extrapolating that right across the nation, they came to the conclusion that, in fact, the spend from the public purse would actually be enough to fund the whole standards production process and to make them freely available. So the conclusion is that there is enough money in the system, it's just going to different places. At that stage, it was um, a lot of it was going um, through SAI Global to a private equity firm um, and the rest to Standards Australia. But meanwhile, um, the Australian, uh, Australian um, well, government was funding this but not having access. So definitely an issue. So the matter was raised by Western Australia to the COAG Industry and Skills Minister. So there was um, a working group uh, found, uh, was formed um, to look at the issue through 2017. Now, interestingly, there were four NASLA CEOs on that working group, often representing their state, plus NASLA itself. Standards Australia argued strongly and consistently that the change to a non-exclusive licence agreement after 2018, when their agreement with SAO Global ceased, would solve the problem because we would have market competition. That would force the price down, it would create other licensing options and everything would be fine. Thank you very much. So overall that COAG work resulted in no change to the community uh, access outcomes. So during this time, interestingly, SAA Global approached NASLA about recommencing negotiations and access was briefly restored. That was until mid-2018 when the new wiring standard was released and suddenly we didn't have access anymore and we've not had access since. So SAI Global then uh, last year uh, went through a consultation process on what their future should look like in terms of its publishing model. And um, there was a submission from the ALCC, NASLA and ALIA. It was a joint submission and you can see it on the ALCC's website. And we argued that there was a strong mandate for Standards Australia to ensure public access. It's laws of the country, there's a significant government funding into this equation to produce these laws. And that profit shouldn't be the driver given the regulatory and public good outcomes of standards. And access should be a core principle 
and we recommended non-exclusive distribution model, preferably using Creative Commons licensing, and that libraries and archives were obvious partners to help to make this happen. So Standards Australia's response when they uh, released the outcome late in 2019. They, they've, they've thought of libraries, and that's a great thing, um, but they're focusing on reading room access, so access just in our reading rooms, no broad um, engage, digital um, uh, delivery across the community, but it's in physical public libraries, and it's only really for, it's only for personal, domestic, and household use. So that private use function. They've committed uh, to funding access to its content for personal, domestic, and household use, but that won't come until 2023. So we still have three years to wait. And in areas of high public interest and benefit, they wanted. They want partners to uh, create plain uh, English guides because apparently the law is complex and they need that. But again, they're looking for volunteer labour to do this. So I, I don't know what you think, but frankly, I don't think it's addressed any of the concerns that the sector has. Um, it's a fairly half-hearted um, uh, response to what I think is a pretty um, important matter. So where are we now? So we are still waiting for a reasonable licensing offer with useful access terms. It looks like it might be 2023 before we're there with that. NASLA has met multiple times with the Standards Australia executive and their new publishers. Uh, the last offer we had uh, was pretty well double the price we were paying under SAI Global, so so much for market competition, driving the price down. And the access terms were even more restrictive. So that argument that we're going to solve this by market competition, it hasn't eventuated. NASLA put a counteroffer in mid-December and there was no response until late last week. Um, so we have an offer. Price-wise, price it's much better. But at the moment, the conditions are such that I think we need to think very carefully about whether we would accept that. Um, it currently undermines some of the principles of anonymity in terms of our users and their use in the reading room because it's saying that, you know, we have to have registered users. Um, there's certainly no broad online access, so it's really not particularly helpful. I, of course, come from looking at the situation in Western Australia. How do I deliver uh, information on standards to someone in Kununurra when it's a, you know, $1,200 return flight to come down to Perth to consult a standard? I can't interlibrary loan it. I can't um, print a portion of it because the licence is saying that I can't. So I'm not sure how far we've got. NASLA will continue to negotiate and try and get there, but we've probably got a decision coming up around whether we continue to make a stand or whether we try and accept the offer and try and negotiate from there. So, back to my opening remarks, there really hasn't been any positive developments, I don't think, in terms of access to uh, Australian standards and particularly those that form part of Australian law. So, thank you. Margaret, specifically now, um, rather than doing a panel at the end like we have with the other sessions, anybody have a specific question for Margaret? Ah, Mark, Derek does. Margaret, who could fix this problem? Sorry? Who could, who fix, could fix this, this problem? problem? Um, well, it's a, it's a political will and a public policy yes. issue. So New Zealand have actually taken their standards development back in to government, so they wound wound up their equivalent. Um, I'm not sure, reports are mixed. I'm not entirely sure that it's rosy, but I think the principle that, that, that they are a public good and therefore governments, uh, and they are law, partly law, therefore government will fund it. There still is a cost recovery model and I don't think any of us would be concerned about that. Um, but I think it's political. Um, COAG didn't really fix it. Um, they've relied on the assurances of Standards Australia that all would be fine with competition. We know from our experience that doesn't necessarily resolve issues. <laughs>
No, no. It sits in the industry and science, and I'm not exactly sure of the current name of the department, but that's where it sits. Um, the, I should point out, of course, Standards Australia could fix it as well, just by yeah. having better licensing terms. The yep. libraries don't actually object to paying for them. It's the fact that they can't that they are so restrictive on top of the high mm, licence fees, the high that's cost. the real concern. Mm. Thanks, Jess. I just wanted to add that as part of the last round of submissions and that to Standards Australia, Ostley offered that if ever the licensing problem is solved, uh, Ostley will be a free access distributor at mm. no cost to anyone else. Yep. So there are there are ways in which it can be done. Uh, I was also going to say, not so much a question but a comment, that it's worth noting too that the Standard Australia distribution framework has no transparency around the consultation that occurred. It doesn't even mention how many submissions were no, made, let alone any kind of overview of what those submissions said or any of the you know, competing ideas or propositions. They just literally go, we did a consultation, this is the framework. Hmm. Correct. Okay.